All right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here this evening. I'm going to open this meeting of the Capitola City Council, and I'll ask our clerk for a roll call, please. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Present. Councilmember Brooks. Here. Councilmember Bertrand. Present. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. Mayor Story. Here. Thank you. Will everybody join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll ask the clerk if we have any uh, additions or deletions to the agenda, I should say, and staff, any changes? No changes to tonight's, to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Next, we'll, uh, I'll ask the city attorney for a report on our closed session meeting from earlier this evening. Good evening, mayor and council and community members. Uh, the council had, a, had closed session on the two items listed on the agenda and no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Do we have any additional materials for this ev evening's meeting? Uh, yes, Mayor Story, there was one memo from staff regarding, I believe it was item 7C, an updated salary schedule, and that was distributed before the meeting. All right, thank you. Next, we'll have uh, oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address the City Council on items that are on our consent agenda or on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that would like to s address the council on public comment? Seeing none, I'll uh, ask the city clerk, do we have anyone on Zoom that would like to address the city council? We do have some people on Zoom, <laughs> but it doesn't look like anyone has their hand up. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to staff and city council comments. Do we have any uh, comments from staff? Staff with no comments this evening. Any comments from council members? I'll start to my left here. Seeing none, no comments. Okay, well. I got a good night's sleep, finally. It's about time. Yes. Um, Next, we'll move on then to the consent agenda items. These items will be passed with one vote unless a council member wishes to pull an item for further discussion. Any council members wish to pull an item? Any pulled? Then I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. There's I'll a second. motion by council member Bertrand, seconded by council member Brown. We have a roll call vote, please. Council Member Brown. Aye. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the general government public hearings uh, portion of our agenda this evening. The first item will be item 8A. And the item is to consider request to fly the Christian flag during the month of December, the month of Easter, and on May 1st, the National Day of Prayer, in accordance with Policy 518, outdoor displays of governmental and non-governmental flags on city prop property. The staff recommended action is to deny the request. Um, can we begin with staff report, please? Chloe Kaiser. Yes. Hi, Chloe. Thank you, yes. Mayor. Yes, give me one moment. Okay, and one more moment. Can you see? Nope, not quite. 
plan is okay everybody can see everything great okay thank you mayor thank you council for your patience I'm just gonna introduce this item and like you mentioned this is about a flag request you may recall you Chloe? approved yes I'm sorry unfortunately it just switched over to show the wrong screen I see that <laughs> uh, thank you one second is that right Oh, maybe it's just catching up. Yeah, it's going to wait a little bit. I could do an interpretive <coughs> dance. No. <laughs> okay. I think, so this is the pace it's going to be. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> here we are. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right. So background, thank you again for your patience. I really do appreciate it. So in May 2021, Council approved our current flag policy. It does include a section regarding non-governmental flags, which outlines also procedure for how the members of the public can request to fly a non-governmental flag here at City Hall. Let's see how. Okay. On September 30th of this year, the city received a member of the public's request to fly the Christian flag at City Hall. As the mayor read, um, this is quoted directly from the request. It was to fly it for in regards of Christmas for the month of December, fly it for Easter, but where Easter falls in the year for the week of Easter, and on the National Day of Prayer, which, as you said, is on the first Thursday of May each year. And here in a second on my screen, and in a few seconds in yours, the picture of the flag will be shown. Um, it, you'll see it on your screen, and according to the request, the flag was conceived in 1897 and adopted by the Federal Council of Churches in 1942. It has been in use worldwide, particularly in Europe, Asia, Latin America, Africa, and Canada. It was designed to be universal, representing all of Christianity, so not one particular denomination. And according to the request, Christianity is the most prevalent religion in the United States. Estimate from 2021 suggests that 65% of adults and 63% of the US population is Christian, and the United States was founded on biblical Christian values, so they feel it's important that we pass that on. And now we have some legal um, analysis. I'll turn it over to the city attorney. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Chloe. So if the council will recall when we enacted your flag policy, um, one of the reasons that we did that and it's stated clearly in the policy is to clearly designate flagpoles as forums for city speech and so because they are designated as a forum for city speech as opposed to speech by the public governments are not permit if a government expresses favoritism for one religion versus another or for religion versus no religion, that is a violation of the federal and st California state establishment clauses in the Constitution. So I think. <coughs> is that the conclusion of your remarks? Yes. Thank you. Are there questions from council members to the city attorney? Are there questions on the staff report? Seeing none, I'll um, open up the mic, see if any members of the public would like to address the city council on this item. Yes, please come up. Hello. Good evening. <coughs> Good evening. My name is David Campbell. I am a pastor. I pastor a church here in the city of Capitola. Um, and I put in the submission, I submitted the proposal for the flag and I just want to first say, before I get into what I want to say about the flag, is that uh, as a pastor here, I pray for all of you, and I, can, I encourage my congregation to do the same, so we, uh, we respect you guys very much and what you do here, so I just want to let you know that we, we pray for you and uh, encourage that as well. So my, my question is, or my remark is, in all due respect, to what was just said and the reasoning for the recommended denial of the proposal is I don't 
actually see the connection to the establishment clause directly. It, it, I, I believe that it's inaccurate to say that governments are prohibited to uh, express a message towards religion. The, my understanding is that the establishment clause was the intent of it, the purpose of it, the reason it was put into place was to uh, keep governments from interfering into the church and to keep the government out of the church, not the church out of government. So that's um, why I'm having a hard time seeing the connection to the denial to the establishment clause specifically as you state as the reasoning. So that's pretty much what I have to say and hopefully you can clear that up. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Campbell. And thank you for your prayers. We need them at times, so she we did. appreciate it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Uh, good evening, my name is Mark Schwinney. Um, I live here locally, have property here, and uh, just found out about this. I thought this is a great opportunity for our community as opposed to something we need to reject maybe too quickly. Um, I just found out about this, so I just uh, went up and looked at the definition of what is a flag, and then I looked up also out of curiosity, because that's a big issue to uh, what is religion. So um, I looked up what is a flag. It's re representation is one of the most common reasons for the flag, so representation. Uh, we'll go through all the different things, but most importantly, a flag reflects and represents the people who fly it. It uh, goes in also that flags of various forms, of course, and different colors, all those kind of things, but it finalizes this point again in the definition, serving for the identification of a friend or foe, and it's also used as rallying points. So it's safe to say that the LGBTQ flag that also reflects you or you who voted for it to fly for a month is this flag that it's already been flagged, the LGBTQ flag, as opposed to we're just asking for a Christian flag also, is, is this flag a rallying point for you and all the morals or lack of morals it represents? Finally, do you realize that flying the flag demonstrates that you are also following a religion and giving statements of beliefs? More specifically, what is religion then? Look up that definition, not my definition. And it's a set of beliefs concerning the cause and nature and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as creation of a superhuman agency or agencies usually involving devotional ritual observances and often containing a moral code of governing and conduct of human affairs. And that's like, has four definitions. I won't go through all of them. That's the first one, and it goes into the second and third one. The third one is interesting. It says a body of persons adhering to a particular set of beliefs, of practices, or world council, or sometimes religions. And fourthly, it says uh, it's something one believes in and follows devotedly in a point of matter of ethics or conscience, you know, to make a religion or fighting prejudice. The, religion, the Christian flag isn't a religion we're trying to promote. It's a relationship and who we believe in. It is a founding documents of our country are founded on Christianity, uh, the separation of church and state, which he's talking about. It was never be to be what the Church of England did to its Christians. It was meant so that people come over here and, and to find its own religious beliefs, not be stuck to the Christian beliefs of the Church of England. But here's my plea. We're only asking that as long as you want to fly the LGP2 flag, plus plus, we also want the right of our government to fly the flag that next to the American flag represents the views of most Americans. Secondly, and again, since you are flying a flag of religious beliefs that it's only a few years old and represents a small part of our country's population, why not allow a flag that represents a set of rela uh, relationship beliefs of our founding fathers, their beliefs and still the beliefs of most Americans, to also fly in honor and remembrance of the great foundation of morals and the majority relationships that still exist today. Uh, at a time when uh, our society is crumbling and falling apart, imploding, it's a time that we may look back to see what held us together, what brought us together, what morals and values, as opposed to one of the things that we keep finding ways to separate ourselves today, which is something we pray against and pray for the unity that you guys are trying to do. So thank you for your time, and I prayerfully, uh, hopefully, you listen to what we're trying to ask for. All right. Thank you, Mr. Sweeney. S is there anyone else? Yes. Hi, TJ. Hello. Bring this down to my level. Uh, good evening. Before, before I get started here, just a few things. One. I'm uh, getting over pneumoma, pneumoma, I can't even say it, N how do I not know the word now? Uh, anyways, I don't have COVID, I'm not contagious, but I do have a cough, 
pneumonia is what I have. So, um, and thank you for all being here talking about COVID. And then thirdly, thank you for the lights. Big change for our little community, look nice. So I'll get started here. Let me start by saying that I know each of you personally and while I respect the positions that you hold, I couldn't be more disappointed in your response to the petition request that was submitted to you like six months ago by the members of our community, the petition to discuss the city's flawed flag policy. Only one council member requested the LGBTQ flag, so certainly any of one of you could have placed this item of the petition on the agenda. I also have shortness of breath, so. Uh, be, but each of you ha have consciously chose to ignore the people. That's not democracy. Democracy is listening to we the people before you make a decision. The flag policy is already flawed, but tonight you're attempting to redefine to meet your political agenda. A city is defined differently than a local government. A city is we the people, the community. A local government is you, the city administrators. Interesting that the, the Boston city loss on the Christian flag Supreme Court judgment, Justice Breyer <coughs> said Boston's flag raising program does not express go government speech. So why the change? You're redefining city to meet the government requirement that Justice Breyer spoke to. That mistake cost Boston 2.1 million sell settlement fees. About your sentiments. We've listened to your words, but your sentiments are demonstrated through your actions. And you've clearly demonstrated the following. You support the LGBT community by flying their flag. In spite of words, your words, you do not support our cops. You denied their flag based on the, its presence at the same insurrection where the LGBTQ flag was present. Some of you protested against our cops in an activist march where they hurled insults and spit at our officers and not one of you condemned their actions. At least one of our council members harassed business owners for displaying police flags during the National Law Enforcement Week. Then based on the staff recommendation tonight, you do not support Christians. Denying a flag request based on the unfounded finding and establishment clause, but I'm pretty confident your sentiments are not so strong <coughs> to turn down your paid Christian holidays. An interesting note, the establishment clause was written years before they adopted the Christian uh, Christmas holiday. So our founders knew about the nexus and actually the establishment clause was supposed to help Christianity and not confine it to one place. Go ahead. I would like to go on. Yeah. So what, you, what will your next sentiments reveal? How about pro-life? National Sanctity of Life is coming up in January. Or how about straight pride? Do you have the same sentiments for straight pride citizens as, as the LGBTQ? Both have flags for proposal. Here's the bottom line. Your sentiments have no business being on public display. As a Christian, I love our LGBTQ uh, people. I love our cops. I love our community. I love our country. But above all, I love God. We do not need division in our community that you're putting out. Council members, there is no positive outcome with your current flag policy. You're choosing to pit neighbor against neighbor. Tonight, you can approve or deny the request recognizing the nationally recognized, federally observed Christian heritage. But there's a third option. You could vote to remove the non-governmental portion of the flag policy realizing that the public display of your sentiments regarding these issues are not in alignment with the community and will only cause more division, discourse, and capitola. I pray you make a wise decision that is in the best interest for those of you who were elected to serve. If not, I plan to see you back here in January when we have at least two new city council members that I'm certain will listen to We the People. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council? Okay. Seeing none in the audience. Um, yes, city attorney. If it would be okay, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to respond to some of the comments. Um, some questions. Why don't we, let's go out to Zoom first. Oh, let's sure. see Sorry. if there's any public comments there. Um, I don't, I don't see any hands. Okay. Yeah, thank All you. All right, thank you. Then I'll, I'll turn the microphone over to you, Madam City Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the establishment clauses in the United States and the California state constitutions. In the United States Constitution, it's a derivative of the First Amendment, um, which states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion 
or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It has been read to go both ways, to prohibit um, the government from establishing a religion and to keep the state out of the church and the church out of the state. I think a common interpretation of that is that it does in fact go both ways. The California provision of the Establishment Clause is actually, it seems a little more pointed, although scholars have interpreted it to be pretty similar to the federal clause. The California Clause is in the Constitution at Section 4. Free exercise and enjoyment of religion without discrimination or preference are guaranteed. The liberty of conscience does not excuse acts that are licentious or is inconsistent with the peace or safety of the state. The legislature shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Justice O'Connor, in a Supreme Court case, it gave what I thought was a pretty succinct explanation of the Establishment Clause. She said, endorsement sends a message to non-adherents that they are outsiders, not full members of the political community, and an accompanying message to adherents that they are insiders, favor favored members of the political community. You can see from that flows the conclusion that um, a government cannot express preference for one religion, Christianity, over perhaps Judaism or Islam or religion in general over no religion. Um, the another, another Supreme Court in 1970, so this has been an issue, the court has ruled on the Establishment Clause multiple times. Another Supreme Court described the Establishment Clause as prohibiting sponsorship, financial support, and active involvement of the sovereign in religious activity. Um, I'll also point out that the city's flag policy requires the city to pay for the flags that it flies. And so certainly that's another reason that the city could not spend money to pay for a flag that clearly preferences one religion over another. Finally, I'd like to address the Supreme Court's ruling in May of 2022 in Shirtleff versus Boston. Um, in that case, Justice Breyer did not say that the Establishment Clause permits uh, or even certainly required Boston to fly the Christian flag. What Justice Breyer said in that case was that because Boston had not been enforcing its flag policy and in fact had, prohibit, had permitted many, many, many groups to fly flags on city-owned flagpoles, that that in fact made city-owned flagpoles into a public forum and so if something is a public forum, there cannot be discrimination. Free speech prohibits discrimination over what type of speech is allowed in that forum. That is why you saw, after the Shirtlift case, many jurisdictions enact flag policies so that they would be they would separate themselves, they would differentiate themselves from the Shirtlift case. So what jurisdictions did, including Capitola, was enact a flag policy that clearly stated that city-owned flagpoles are forums for expression of city speech, not the public speech. And if it is expression for city speech, the city as a local government cannot express preference for religion, for one religion over the other, or religion versus non-religion. Thank you. Thank you. So um, with that, I'll bring the item back to the council for further deliberation and potential action. Um, is there a council member that would like to lead off? Yes, council member Bertrand. I'll, I'll take a, a go on it. Um, first of all, thank you um, those who brought this here. Um, TG, I know, is very involved in this. We've actually spent many hours talking about various issues that he brought up when he spoke today just now. Um, originally, I had planned not to be at this meeting, not because of the agenda, but I had something very important in my life um, that I wanted to do. I have not missed any city council meetings except for city business when I went to Cal League. So it was significant. Um, religion is a big part of my life just as much it is for other people. I'm not a, a minister or any, anything like that. I've gone to parochial schools, Mariners Fathers, and then the Jesuits, which, as you know, is probably one of the strictest that there are in terms of running a school, University of San Francisco, and teaching you Christian or Catholic principles of life. 
So I've thought about this issue on many levels over the course of my life. This is not something new to me. How do you express your religion and what is expected of those around you, including government, in terms of supporting that expression and what involvement they may have in terms of expression? I remember um, running up to the top of a hill in, in, um, in uh, San Rafael. There was a, a big cross on the top. I was in the military academy at the time. And, <laughs> you know, the issue then was on public land, could you put a cross? And, you know, in San Francisco, there was other crosses that brought this issue up. And so in my life, I've followed this issue considerably. Even though I was raised Catholic, my parents sent me to a Jewish community center and I re received instruction on what it meant to be a good Jew. And my parents had no problem with that. Uh, we sent our daughter to Monte Vista, which is a Christian school, and we had no problem with that. So our sense of religion is basically that it's a deeply held thing, but it's yours. So when I think about this particular issue and the idea that our Constitution has explicitly said there should be a separation between church and state, it's not unlike Jesus' prayer parable, which I'm sure you all know. There are times when you give something to the state, and there's times that that is given to God. And in this case, it's true, our country was founded by many religious groups that came from Europe because of persecution. And the Catholic Church splintered off into many different uh, religions and there was persecution between various religions and others because maybe they're small or different views. I am not a, a, a religious historian, so I do not know that. But I do know that our colonies came about because of that. They had to escape from Europe to find a place where they could exercise their religion in freedom. But I also know that when the Constitution was made by these same people, that came here to establish a country based on, and they were religious. It's inherent in their writings that these are important ideals that they wanted to protect in a new government. Even though they were here because of religious reasons and had that history, they still provided for the separation of church and state. There's a reason for that. And recently I spent a bunch of time reading to try to understand what perhaps is the reason. Their history is they came from a place where there was a lot of war and strife between and persecution because of religious views. And if you create a system which starts to favor different religious views, we have countries in this world which are extremely repressive because they represent one religious view in exclusion to others to the extent that people are killed in their country because they have a different religious view. So the thing that struck out in what I read, and I try to put a lot of thoughts in these things, is that we're here, us five people are here to protect the Constitution. We swore to that. And in trying to do that, we also want to create our decisions in such a way, make our decisions in such a way, excuse me, to avoid strife, to try to come up with policies and exercising policies, in this case, that's what we're doing, to try to relieve strife from our community so all of us can live together. And in this case, all of us live together irrespective of what religious views you have. I highly respect, I highly respect, without any doubt in my soul, that religion is a deep part of our country. Our religions are much more than Christian religions now. This country has gone way beyond the people who came here in the Mayflower, whatever vessels they, they were, 
with the different religions that they held in dearness to their existence, such that they sacrificed the possibility. They, people coming across the Atlanta those days did not know they were going to get here. <coughs> My relatives did that. They had a hike across the Isthmus of Panama. They did not know they were going to get here, but they wanted to because it was a land of freedom. So I sincerely understand and believe and know because of my history that religion is clearly a part of this country. But our country has grown. We now are willing to accept that the native people, the people who are indigenous, have their own religions with great value, which the ones who came here did not recognize to the extent that they try to obliterate them. We have Muslims. We have all sorts of people. We have all sorts of people, many of which are friends of mine, and I love their religions when they, when they take the time to explain them to me. They're not Christian, though. That's why I bring it up. So the idea, as our city attorney mentioned, the sense of exclusion comes about, and this is not a country of exclusion. This is a country of inclusion. It is a hard lesson to act on. It is a hard lesson to carry out. And as you all know, we're going through that right now. But we are a country that is going to succeed in doing that. And we are a country that's going to learn our lessons as we go along and become better at doing that. And I hope a negative vote here doesn't mean to those who put it forth that we're anti-religion. What it means to me is I'm in a country that protects all religions, doesn't favor another, any one over the other, and we do this so that we could live peacefully together. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Bertrand. Um, other Council Members would like to address this? Yes, Council Member Brown. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Pastor Dave, it's good to see you again. I know we've spoken about other issues in the past, and though we haven't always seen eye to eye, I've always very much appreciated um, that we've been able to have respectful conversations with each other um, and, and hope to continue to do so in the future. Um, I want to acknowledge the good work of the faith community overall as a community partner in line with nonprofits, other government agencies, businesses, it is by working together that we create um, such a beautiful community. And of course, the faith community in general is, is definitely a part of that, and I, I will not deny that. Um, I think those who have served on government bodies, those who um, make decisions on behalf of their communities or their congregations, uh, quite often know that these uh, decisions aren't always personal in nature, but made in the consideration of the benefits and consequences consideration of those who are helped and those who will be harmed, and of course, in alignment with the advice that we receive um, from, from those, um, well, I guess I could say those above us, regardless if that be uh, in terms of those who have higher authority in law or higher authority in life, depending on how you would, how you would look at it. Um, so I, I wanna start by saying those two things because I do um, believe that staff recommendation is the best way to go tonight in denying the flag uh, request. But again, I mention that um, in, in line with the idea that these decisions aren't always personal in nature. This isn't a personal attack, in my opinion, um, on those making the request as much that it, as it is a decision that needs to be made um, with all the considerations that I just mentioned. But again, I thank you for being here tonight. All right. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Um, is there another Council Member that would like to address this item? Yes, yeah. Council Member Brooks. Thanks, Mayor Story. I just want to echo our, the sentiments from both Council Member Bertrand and Council Member Peterson and, and, and in total agreement. And Pastor Dave, um, Mr. Campbell, thank you for your prayers this evening. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, thank you, um, everybody who showed up and who spoke um, on this item. Uh, I know it takes a, a lot to get a group of people together to do anything. So that uh, there shows your faith and your, your backing behind this. And I, I want to come off of what Council Member Brown said and that it, it, this by no means is a personal situation 
for me. It is more about, as Jacques said, in- inclusion. And that's more of where m- my personal thoughts go and I think the thoughts of the council um, as we try to be inclusive with one another and with the city as well. Um, so, and I do respect what our attorney has had to say as well and I think that that is um, sort of where we have to uh, be more careful for us as a city to maintain common ground for everybody. Um, but everybody, thank you so much for what you said tonight, and I appreciate all the involvement. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor um, Kaiser. Um, is there a motion on the on the table? I'll move the denial of the request for item eight A. I can second that. Okay, there's a motion by Councilmember Brooks, uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Kaiser to deny the request. Um, uh, before I ask for a roll call vote, um, I guess um, I, w- I would like to also address the item. Um, and uh, um, thank you for bringing it forth. It is really um, thought provoking. Um, and it, because it's true, um, I think religion is a big part of all our upbringings and all our lives, um, and it should continue to be so. Um, and um, so for that, and, and to bring it forth, um, I do appreciate that. Um, I think I wanna speak to, because um, this seems to spring from what I hear and my experience um, on this issue. It originated when we um, voted to approve the gay pride black. Um, and that's, that certainly is, seems to be the source of it. Now, I feel like I, I think I want to address um, for myself personally why I supported that motion. Um, because um, I felt that one of our tasks and what we are trying to do was to recognize groups that have historically uh, been discriminated against, been um, you know, shut out of society, uh, have been treated very harshly. Um, and for many of you that don't know me, I grew up in the South. Um, I grew up in the South in a religious family. Um, and there were, um, I would say that even in that social context, two of the most um, vilified um, and discriminated against groups in that society were gays and African Americans. Um, and I think that what we were trying to do in, um, uh, in both uh, the gay pride flag and the ba- Black Lives Matter march was to bring some recognition uh, that that f- form of discrimination needs to come to an end in our society. And I think that we were trying to um, present a position of inclusiveness where previously it did not exist. And to me, this is different because I don't know, you know, the Christian religion is a predominant religion. You're right. Um, and, uh, um, but I don't know that we need the same kinds of protection and symbolism uh, within our religion that those groups uh, did. So I just wanted to maybe explain, you know, my personal positions on why um, we had um, agreed to that. Um, And I'm going to support the motion as well for the many reasons, both the legal position um, and also on that position about being inclusive because as much as we all are, I think that we have to recognize that not everyone is not even in Capitola, Uh, not everyone is. Um, And we do we want to give them a sense that they're not a part of our community. I don't think that's our objective. So now with that, um, you know, I'm on my way out from this council. Um, I have two meetings left. Um, I want, and whoever, I want to encourage council members who are remaining 
uh, and the new council members that will come forth and I don't know who those are. None of us know who those are yet. Um, but I would encourage them to revisit this flag policy. Um, and I, you know, and, and I just, I'm, to be clear, and I'm not saying that in any way of regretting um, our tribute to the great gay community and flying the gay pride flag. Um, and I think, though, there are different ways that the city can express its support for various causes, groups, um, from time to time, without it being a part of our flag policy. And I, and I do feel that we need to have one unifying symbol within our community within our state, within our country. And to me, that's, it's our flag. Um, and, and, I, and I'm not trying to get applause about that, but that, that is just, you know, I, I really believe that we need to have one symbol on that flagpole um, that we can all look to, to say that regardless of our color, regardless of our orientation, regardless of our religion, we all um, are, have a common bound with the values expressed in that flag. And the values expressed in that flag are one reason why I'm voting in, in support of this motion, just to be clear on that as well. But I do want to say that, and I hope that the council will continue this discussion, you know, when it um, gets reconstituted and will consider, you know, uh, these thoughts. So with that, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Brown. Aye. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Bertrand. I agree. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, the next item, which is item 8B, which is consider a cannabis delivery ordinance amendment. The recommended action is to introduce by title only, waiving for the reading of the text, an ordinance amending Capitola Municipal Code sections 5.36 and 9.61, allowing cannabis deliveries within the city of Capitola from any authorized licensed retailers physically located within Santa Cruz County. Um, staff report, please. Okay. So kick this off. <laughs> Just hear so much whispering. <laughs> Secrets don't make friends, guys. This computer is going to be replaced next meeting. Yes. Okay. Confirmed. <laughs> All right. I think it's lagging a little bit. It's just lagging. Give it a okay. track. <laughs> I don't. Okay. It's okay. There it's go. okay on, on the other Zoom. Okay. <clears throat> I'll get, I'll get going here. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. I'm here this evening to request an ordinance amendment on our cannabis delivery. And so I'll move through a couple of slides here. 
Uh, this first slide is uh, just a quick overview. Currently, we have two retail cannabis licenses uh, that are issued to uh, the Apothecarium that's on 41st Avenue, and then also the Hook Dispensary that's uh, uh, off of um, a Gross Road. Uh, both retailers are currently in good standing and have passed our annual inspections and audits, and so uh, they've been really good partners with us. And then this last year, we, we discovered that there was issues with the regional de the delivery. And so our retail locations could not deliver to, and to the outside to the county. And likewise, uh, the county was not allowed to kind of deliver in our jurisdiction. Um, and so that brought up um, our request tonight. So I'll give you a little bit of background. I'm hoping the screen gets caught up here. You have a mic if you were still. I was just okay. I'll just pause for a second. You might just want to go. I don't know if it's going to okay. change. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as a little bit of background um, uh, about our cannabis uh, program that we have, the retail cannabis, in no November of 2018, the residents passed a ballot measure um, uh, implementing our retail cannabis uh, program. Uh, we added at that time section 5.36, which outlines our re retail cannabis sales in, in our jurisdiction. Um, 9.61 restricts commercial sales of cannabis within the city's jurisdiction. And again, uh, we proposed uh, in 2022, we, we discovered some issues and that's why we're proposing the amendments to the, to the current ordinance that would allow for retail cannabis uh, delivery both inside our jurisdiction and outside the jurisdiction. And so um, the proposed amendment, um, like I said, we, we, we had those issues that we discovered and there was lack of consistency with the local regulations. Our regional management staff met and we all agreed upon a proposed plan that would essentially bring all of the local jurisdictions on the same line so there's consistent messaging from our jurisdiction to the local jurisdictions. Um, the proposed amendments to 5.36 and 961, uh, they, they will ally, uh, align with our regional partners and it's also will support, the, the language in it will support an upcoming uh, Senate bill that's, that will become in effect in 2024, but it's Senate Bill uh, 1186, which essentially bans local, jurisdi local jurisdictions from allowing uh, cannabis deliveries for medicinal patients. So language also supports that upcoming bill. And so this evening we're uh, considering uh, requesting to introduce by title only, waiving for the reading of the text and ordinance amending, amending Capitol Muni Code sections 5.36 and 9.61, allowing cannabis deliveries within the city of Capitola from any authorized licensed retailer physically located in Santa Cruz County. And with that, I can answer any questions. Questions? Yeah, Council Member Bertrand. Hi. Um, so, Chief, I don't know if you were here when we, I don't think you were here. When, yeah, you were on the force when the first ordinance was passed and maybe uh, Jamie um, city manager can answer this question I remember we explicitly did not want to have deliveries into our area and out of our area at the time and the issue uh, I remember people were doing it surreptitiously they were coming in they didn't seem to care w do you recall the discussion then I'm just trying to relive those issues um, thank you Cou Councilmember Bertrand so I think what was happening this was about a decade ago I think and that was when we passed the original ordinance which I believe was is it 961 is 961 yeah. the one was, and that was a blanket prohibition on all co cannabis activities ca commercial cannabis activities and so at that point we were concerned about deliveries coming in I think it was Chief es Escalani at the time he was concerned about how that was going to be regulated and so we passed sort of a blanket um, blanket ban on commercial cannabis activities. Since that time, we've modified it several times, including when we allowed um, laboratory, commercial laboratories and testing facilities to operate within the city. And then we passed our commercial, uh, sorry, retail cannabis licensing ordinance as well. So this would sort of be the third change I think we've made to the rules around what what's allowed commercially and allowing the, the cannabis deliveries. The biggest thing is, is this is going to be syncing up with all the other jurisdictions. So the city of Santa Cruz right now only allows deliveries from their own licensed retailers and the county only allows deliveries from their licensed retailers. This is saying as long as you're licensed in the county, you can deliver in the county. So that's, that's kind of the biggest thing is we're sort of syncing up with everybody else. We've got that and the chief did say that and thanks for the history because I remember the discussion about it. Yeah but not accurately. <laughs> Thank you. 
Any other questions from council members? No. Chief, thank you. Um, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, it said that the, the, in the staff report, it says that the plan will ensure that deliveries are subject to local regulations and taxes. Mm -hmm. How will we assure that Capitola gets its fair share of taxes? Will it be location specific or destination specific? So my understanding is that currently we're all set on the same tax rate at 7%. And so I think it's just making sure that the local jurisdictions keep with that and not try and go higher or lower to, to be competitive. Um, right. And so I think it's just important that the local jurisdictions make sure that they keep that, that, that percentage the same. But, but if our um, local retailer, Apothecarium, will, if they deliver outside of our city limits, will they report to Capitola as taxable income, even for those sales? Yeah, because my understanding is the point of sale would be Capitola, the delivery would just be outside. So it'd be, it would be a capital. It's a tax. point of sale right. determination. Right. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, that clarifies that for me. Um, I, I had one other follow-up question. Since the other jurisdictions have not yet approved this, should our action be conditional upon a uniform adoption among the other jurisdictions? So I believe that one of the other jurisdictions has already had a first reading was it this yeah. week Santa Cruz I think did Santa Cruz had it they it went through their planning and it's set to go before their council I think in the next week or so I think we could I mean so we have a second reading that would be coming up next meeting and so if council directed we could write the second reading to say it takes effect when say the county of Santa Cruz is, takes effect Okay. Are you okay with that, Sam? Well, we would need to rewrite the. We would need to change the effective date in the ordinance. We, for the second reading. No, I mean because the ordinance itself is different. So we would want to. Ch the ordinance itself says that it takes effect 30 days from its passage. So we would want to change the actual ordinance. Um, what you might do is just do the first reading tonight. I think we'll know by then whether or not. Um, Santa Cruz has adopted the county and the city. I don't know what schedule they're on. Have adopted theirs, and if not, you just don't pass it at the second at reading. The next reading. Yeah. I, I want to bring one other thing to the council's attention about this ordinance, but I, I, I want to make sure that I'm not cutting off Chief Dowley. No. Okay. So there's one other section of the ordinance, so that would need to be amended. Um, the ordinance itself in your packet is correct. There's just a slight glitch in that recommended action. And that is that the ordinance actually does two things. One is it trues up your ordinance with actions that are being taken in the county, as Chief Daly explained, um, allowing delivery of all cannabis from any um, uh, retailer that is located within Santa Cruz County. That's one. Two, there is legislation that was recently passed that requires jurisdictions to allow cannabis delivery from anywhere in the state of medicinal cannabis. That takes effect in January of 2024. We decided that it made more sense for you rather than amending your ordinance now and then having to come back and do it in January 2024 to just do both amendments of your ordinance now. So um, the title of the ordinance in your packet on oh i'm looking at the wrong one on page 30 of your packet is correct i think that that is just missing a little bit of the end so if whoever makes the motion if you just want to say that you want to move the first reading of the ordinance in the pack ordinance in the packet that's fine or i can help you that's fine i just wanted to point it out to you all right yeah thank you um, okay, with that, I'll, are there any members of the public that would like to address the council about cannabis? Seeing none. Um, Chloe, do we have anyone on Zoom that? Let me check. I do not see anyone with their hand up. Okay, thank you. With that, I'll bring it back to the council for further deliberation and action. I'll move approval of the recommended action. Uh, and to approve the first reading? If I could oh. request, if, if I could ask that perhaps, um, Council Member Brown, you mean approval of the uh, first reading waiving full title, or 
approval for first reading only, waiving full reading of the text of the ordinance located at page 30 in the packet. Yeah, that's what I meant to Thank say. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Second. <laughs> Okay, that's been a motion by Councilmember Brown, as quoted by City Attorney <laughs> Zutler, <laughs> and seconded by Councilmember Bertrand. And I can't believe we're discussing home delivery of cannabis <laughs> and things have changed. Local government. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, I just, I just have to. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, being a baby boomer, this is you know. I'm, I'm, Big change. Um, so with that, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Mayor Story. Aye. The Thank motion you. passes unanimously, which will bring us to item 8C, which is the introduce an ordinance amending chapter 15.04 of the Capitol and Municipal Code pertaining to building and fire code. Um, just going to do the staff report on this item. So we have a, a staff member who is going to be zooming in from upstairs. She has a sick kid at home, so she's trying to stay out of chambers. Uh, Director Hurley, you are on. Thank you, Jamie. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. We can. Great. And are my slides okay? Well, so that's the rub, is, is that unfortunately our computer is very slow, so it may be okay, but it may take 30 seconds for it to look right down here. So <laughs> right now we're not seeing, oh no, right now we are just seeing your, your outline view. Oh, okay. I'm seeing as well. It, hopefully it'll come up in just a few more seconds. It seems to be a night of computer glitches. Try resume slideshow, Katie. You see that little button there, kind of floating, sort of up, just in the middle of up, right there. Oh, yeah. There we go. No. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I guess the meeting's. Yeah. Over. Try one more time. Slideshow from beginning, maybe. Try the button on the far left there. From the beginning? Yeah. Oh, you can see it. Load file. Try that thing again. I don't mind the outline view. Hmm. Well, maybe so we just maybe we just do the outline view. Yeah. Okay. So I apologize. Um, Okay, before you this evening is an ordinance amending chapter 1504 for the building and fire code. This, um, every, every three years, we, um, there's a requirement as a state to update our building and fire code. The new edition will take effect on January 1st, 2023. So um, I'm just gonna highlight some of the most significant changes. Our building official, Robin Woodman, actually teaching a class this evening, so she's unable to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk through these four items that are the most significant changes, but she did say that anyone that has questions on any of the technical um, updates, she's, you're welcome to reach out to her in the following week, and she'd be happy to walk you through them. So the, the most significant amendment is that the new code allows jurisdiction to go beyond our typical permanent expiration of 180 days. There are now options to go up to a full year. Um, we are opting to keep, we're recommending that we keep the existing code language to expire permits within 180 days as ongoing construction can be a nuisance to neighbors and um, it's just good to keep the projects moving along for health and safety reasons. So we are, that is one item that we're um, suggesting that we keep at 180 days. There is also um, construction, uh, concrete construction standards that are being replaced within this update. I don't know the specifics behind that, but if you do have questions, um, Robin could get into the details on that. 
Um, with this adoption also comes the adoption of the 2022 California Fire Code as amended and adopted by Central Fire Protection District. And there's a new uh, mandatory law that's not, this is not an option for us, that we incorporate in the Swimming Pool Safety Act. So those are the four major changes, and the, the most significant one being keeping the 180 days for permit expiration. The recommended action this evening is to introduce for first reading by title only, waiving further reading of the text, a proposed ordinance amending Municipal Code Chapter 15.04 pertaining to building and fire codes. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Other questions? Seeing none, uh, is there any member of the public that would like to address the council? On this item, seeing none, anyone on Zoom that would like to address the council? No. None. Okay. I'll bring it back for um, a motion. I'm going to try it again. I'm going to redeem myself this time. <laughs> I'm, I move to introduce, we're on C, right? Introduce for first reading by title only, waiving further reading of the text to propose ordinance amending Municipal Code Chapter 1504 pertaining to building and fire codes. Crushed it. Thank you. <laughs> my I can second that. <laughs> Good job. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by the City Attorney. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, by Vice Mayor Kaiser. I'll call for a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Bertrand. I approve. Vice Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Mayor Story? Aye. The motion, that item passes unanimously, which will now bring us to item D, 2022 Zoning Code Amendments. The recommended action is to introduce the for first reading by title only, waiving further reading of the tax and the ordinance, amending Title 17, Zoning of Capitola Municipal Code, amending the Capitola General Plan land use map, and amending the Capitola zoning map, and to adopt the proposed resolution amending the general plan land use map. And uh, I'll bring it back to you, Katie. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor Story and Council, and Jamie, thank you for running this presentation well, for me. So, um, Katie, before you get started, before you're I so I'm running it here, and I'm seeing your intro slide, but unfortunately, I don't think you're seeing it because it's so slow this evening. So. No, it's fine in Zoom, Jamie. Is it fine in yeah, Zoom? I'm seeing it. Okay, fine great. In Zoom. Okay, never mind. Kick it off, Katie. Okay. Okay. It looks like they're right. So tonight, um, I'm presenting. We've um, undergone a since we adopted our zoning code, um, which was a very long process that you all helped us through, and it was certified by the Coastal Commission back in 2021. We've noticed some issues uh, that need cleanup in the code. And then there's also been a few new laws that have passed that have also influenced the zoning code. So we are, um, our goal is to clean up the zoning code by the end of the, the year. So we can start fresh in 2023. And here on this slide, I have the topics of interest. Um, um, and I'm happy to talk through and I have slides for every item that's listed here. Tonight, I plan on, I've got slides that I was going to introduce for the cannabis retail sign. Uh, I've got one six that needs to happen for the pergolas, arbors, and trellis. And then also I was going to present on the Marnock Cove Inn. And at this time, Mayor Story, I was going to ask if there are any other items here that you would like, or you or any of the council members, would like presented this evening. Are there any requests from council members on uh, particular presentation? Um, yes, council member Bertrand. Um, Katie, I just have a question. Is generators the one that deals with also the, um, the windmill type generators? No, we did not consider the windmill type generators. Okay. Um, Katie, I have a question about um, roof decks, second story um, decks and balconies, but um, okay. you want, may want to just handle that as a question to staff. Okay, I can bring up those 
slides as well. They're, they actually follow these first three. And, okay. and then I can answer the question when we get there. Okay? Um, so I'll jump in. Uh, so our cannabis retail signs. Um, the existing code has a max limit of one sign per business. And the, um, the it's limited, the one sign is limited to 15 square feet and one, or one square foot per linear footage of business, whichever is uh, less. And then we think that we, we um, there's also, there are other requirements there, but those were the two that we were suggesting the planning commission get rid of, just allowing um, the signs to, the sign of a sign to be equal to what's allowed for all other businesses. And when we took that change to the Planning Commission, they said, you know, um, now that we've gotten more familiar with the cannabis establishments in Capitola, we would like to suggest that we remove all special sign requirements for cannabis establishments. Next slide, Jane. So on this next slide, I list out all of the sign requirements for cannabis establishments. The existing code has a max of one exterior sign per business a max sign area of 15 square feet, like I just mentioned. Um, sorry, spelling error there, thing. Uh, the sign may include only the name of the business and one green cross. Sign may not have any reference to symbols or language to cannabis with the exception of one green cross. And the sign shall not be directly illuminated except during operating hours. So the Planning Commission proposal was to remove all five of those standards. Um, if you'd like, we can move on to the next item, or I'm happy to answer questions. We'll move on to the next. Yeah, go ahead. So pergolas, pergolas trellis, and arbors. Um, the existing code was very confusing. There were not um, clear definitions of the three, and then um, the allowances within the setback standards and encroachment standards uh, were not clear. So the proposed amendments were to add definitions for pergolas, arbors, and trellises, and to allow a pergola to be attached to a building wall. You see a lot of homes that have pergolas attached to their the home and um, come off of the home into either the front setback or the rear setback that previously um, there was no allowance for those encroachments. It also allows freestanding pergolas in the rear and an interior side. It's open on all sides. This has been, become very popular with all these with the outdoor kitchens that we've recently seen the trend with. And then the, it specifically excludes pergolas from the floor area calculations uh, if it's open on at least three sides. Next slide. Um, these are just pictures and the new definitions for pergola, trellis, and arbor. Next slide. Um, the correction that I'm bringing to you now is we noticed um, the highlighted box um, was incorrect. We meant to update that. And I have the suggested language in the second paragraph saying up to two arbors of up to Ten feet in height, with a minimum of two open sides utilized over a walkway. So, um, before the, the standard was the same for the trellis structure up to ten feet in height, and then it, it was we were supposed to cross that out and then specify what the new standard was for arbors. So, in the motion this evening, when we get to the slide, that language will be included in the slide for the motion. That's a correction. Next slide, please. The last item that I had for discussion um, was the Monarch Cove Inn. And I just wanted to give you an overview of why this is before you tonight. So the amendments include zoning text, the zoning an amendment to the zoning map, and also an amendment to the general plan map. Next slide. Um, the background on this is that when we originally uh, went through our zoning code update. There was a proposed change from visitor serving, which it currently is now. Change it to R1 single family with a visitor serving overlay. When the code
Coastal Commission certified our zoning code. The one item they did not include in the certification were the changes to the Monarch Coven. And they instructed their staff at the time, uh, they weren't saying they were going to deny it. They said they needed more time and to understand it better and that they wanted this reviewed as a separate item. Following that meeting, we met with Coastal Commission and asked exactly what they would like and what they wanted was more financial documentation to evaluate the, uh, the feasibility of the hotel into the future. So, next slide, please. So the owner submitted this, the application for the, the zoning change would allow them the option to retire and revert the property to a residential use and have the flexibility of their managing their estate. Um, so there, the reason for this is also because the scale of the property and the level of profitability as well. Next slide. So the proposed map amendments, the zoning map would, and the general plan map would change from visitor serving to um, R1, single family with a visitor serving overlay. And the zoning text would be changed to allow residential use within, with a CUP. Next slide, please. And you may recall when we went through the zoning code update, there were two conditions that if they were to convert, if they came in with a CUP to convert this to single family, it could be allowed only in conjunction with an overnight accommodation on at least one of the properties, or if they granted a public access, public access to a viewpoint. So those are, we, we are resubmitting, the, uh, what's drafted in our code tonight is exactly what was proposed back in 2021. Next slide, please. Um, so we did go, we, we went through um, a financial documents, we did a feasibility analysis, a feasibility study. We hired a third party, Cosmont um, company to look, to go over their ongoing costs. Um, they did an evaluation which was in the packet this evening. And their findings was that their profitability is extremely limited and it's due to um, the very high cost was running with um, the old 11 room Victorian building, also the extensive gardens on almost two acres of property, and all of the restrictions in the CUP. So um, events are very limited in the time frame which they can be held at the hotel. Um, so with the limited 4% profitability, the uh, Cosmont found that the feasibility for ongoing success Successes is, is the challenge for the hotel. So, um, and then also they went through evaluation of um, residential versus the hotel use. And residential would be slightly higher as the hospitality use is extremely expensive to run and due to the limited restrictions tied to the CUP. Next slide, please. So this evening, um, the recommended action listed here. I won't read, read it all for you at this time, but um, I, I will move on actually to one more slide, Danny, so we can talk about second story deck. So second story deck, we had, um, during the zoning code update, we had excluded second story decks from floor area ratio. And what we're seeing is a trend of larger decks coming in, in proposals and a lot of, um, it was causing issues of privacy in front of in the planning commission um, meetings. I recall one night that we had three different applications with second story decks that really brought all the neighbors out. And the planning commission said we really need to create some better objective standards um, and limitations for these second story decks. So the existing code it requires a design permit. It has to go before planning commission. Um, they're they're and it's excluded from the FAR. And then next slide, please. The new code, and the items in blue are what the Planning Commission added during the last meeting. So they've added a new 150-foot FAR exception. So you could have like a, um, a 10 by 15 deck or a couple 
holds different decks, but it's only up to 150 square feet before it would start counting towards your floor area ratio. It's not allowed to face the side parcel line abutting a single family home. There are increased setbacks to second story decks, so they not only have to be within the building footprint, but kind of set in. Um, and one addition the planning commission made was that um, a permanent privacy screen would be required so that there's a rear deck along the side railing facing any single family home. They also may not project further than six feet from the wall. And, um, and the last item is just for the more towards lower decks. Any deck above 35 inches from the ground counts as um, above grade and counts towards FAR. So, um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there questions from council member? Yeah, council member, right? Yeah, thank you. I just have a quick question for clarification about the cannabis signs. Um, so the slide, or I believe somewhere in the packet, it mentions that it's removing the requirements for cannabis signs. Um, so it sounds like the planning commission is just removing the limitations on cannabis signs that other signs don't have. But then later on 259 in the packet, it says this, that this brings cannabis sign standards closer to alignment with other business identification sign standards. So I'm trying to determine, is there still some kind of difference that we're going to see between cannabis signs and other business signs, or are they about to be, are they going to be the same thing now? It would be the same thing. Okay, cool. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Other questions from council member? Yeah, council member Brooks. Um, Thank you, Katie, for the presentation. Um, uh, regarding the second story decks and balconies, I know that there was some spirited conversation around this particular area at, at Planning Commission. And I'm just trying to think about the already made decks and the screening that is required from here on out and if there was any conversations about addressing something like that so that's my first question then my second question is isn't there a requirement of like a 10 foot separation when you build houses and how in relation can we cannot project more than six feet from a wall you're talking about a wall from another home i'm just trying to wrap my mind around that yeah, okay. um so for the your first question about the new standard for um, the permanent privacy screen along the side of a rear facing deck, any new application would be required to have that. Existing decks that do not have those would be legal, uh, non-conforming. So they could continue as they are. Your second question about the 10 foot setback. Um, so on a property, if any building, if, if any Part of the building is within five feet. It's subject to fire standards. Um, so you, you either have to have fire rated walls or if it gets, there, there are certain um, parameters that it could also trigger sprinklers or fire rated walls. So there's, you can definitely have um, structures within five feet of the property line, but then they have to be fire rated. And the projection of six feet would be for the actual parcel that's being developed with a deck. So there, if you imagine a home on the back of the home, the deck is only allowed to extend six feet off the back of the home. Or if it was on the front of the home, it would have a max projection of six feet towards the front. Um, but keeping in mind that they still have front and rear setbacks. So it's really, it's just kind of um, for the second story limiting how big these can be in, in an attempt to limit how much activity can be can happen on a second story deck and to prevent to protect privacy okay and my last question then is that we went from not counting towards far to completely counting towards far with an exception of 150 square feet which sounds really really small to me um and I'm wondering, I, I'm just curious about being, uh, about why you would want to start counting it towards far now than before. And, and sure. So our old code included um, all secondary 
second story deck as well as covered front porches on the first story for its floor area ratio and there was a cap of 150 square feet. Um, and we were not having issues at Planning Commission because people were not building really large decks. Um, so then when we updated the code in 2021 and removed the floor area ratio cap, that's when we started seeing the issue of privacy concerns and larger decks. Um, so taking this to Planning Commission, this was actually uh, the main topic of debate was whether or not um, to include it in the FAR again. And at first there was conversation about including it in the FAR and also including the first story covered deck. And um, the ultimate decision was, well, we should, we should be a little more loose in terms of allowing, like a little more permissive in terms of allowing second story decks. So this exception exceeds what we had in the code prior to 2021. So it's kind of a middle ground um, between the extreme of 2021 and not counting it at all and previous code being more limiting. And can someone create a request like a var? Is it called a variance or, or appeal yeah. the, okay. Um, and then last question, I promise, because I know everyone likes talking about second story decks Are tonight. You a deck? I, 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 <laughs> wish, I actually wish I could. I'm not allowed in my HOA to build a deck or extend a deck. Um, strong feelings about that situation. But um, <laughs> the screening, I'm just, I guess I'm getting caught up on the screening. Are you going to provide like recommendations for people on which ones to buy? I just, it just sounds so like it could just look really ugly if you if you don't provide some input or or could not necessarily it, like someone could make it up uh, what a privacy screening re is you know yes um, so as we we're going through some of these more controversial decks this this kept coming up with the privacy screening. We saw quite a, a mix of what people wanted for their privacy screening as we started to condition permits. So opaque glass is one option. Um, these don't require a design permit, so it does go before planning commission. Um, you, you could definitely um, ask tonight, but I get more specific. We actually have uh, Ben Noble of Ben Noble Planning is here at season two who drafted all of the language for the, the update, but we could go back and add some specificity there for the second reading, if you'd like, of exactly what could be allowed, or if there are certain things that um, you would like to make sure are not allowed, we can also take that approach. So, Thank you, Katie. Those are all my questions. Any other questions? Um, Katie, um, I had a question also about the um, uh, second story decks, balconies, and um, potentially roof decks as well. It's on page um, 114 of the staff packet, um, subchapter 11, and this is 11B, the wording there. Um, You see where where I am. I mean, it. Or what page uh, at the top right? It says page. Top page right. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's eight of one hundred and fifty. Okay. And item B, it says um, a second story deck or ba balcony may not face an interior side parcel line abutting a lot with a single family dwelling. Um, and um, I think I understand most of that, but the part that kind of uh, tripped me up was where it says may not face. Um, I could understand um, if you just had um, kind of an enclosed second story deck, uh, it looks out in one direction. Um, but if you have a corner deck um, or a wraparound deck, or, in, or if you have a roof deck, which in, under certain circumstances would be allowed, how do you determine in which way it faces? That's a great question. Um, so this, the 
with this standard, it, it's really, we should probably clean that up to say that it must, it cannot project from the side. I think that's what we're trying to get at is it can project from um, the rear of the home or from the front of the home or from a street side, but when it's between two homes, a deck should not face. But I think a cleanup there could be a, a second story deck or balcony may not project from an interior. Okay. Well, thank thank side you. Wall. Thank structure would that be better well, th well just thank you for validating my confusion about trying to figure that out um, and determining under these various scenarios which part of it face which way um, and so yeah I, I would think maybe more specific language just so you don't we don't get in to uh, future confusion about that um, so um, that was my question um, now, I also need to make a disclosure um, concerning the Monarch Cove. Um, I have a conflicting um, property interest since I live right behind it, and so I'm going to ask that that item be considered separately and discussed separately, um, and maybe Vice Mayor Kaiser. We would have needed to have segmented the item um, for the discussion tonight we actually have to to segment the item we actually have to take that portion of the item first and then segment it from the entire so my recommendation would be that if you have a conflict I I think you, you probably need to recuse from the entire from the remainder of the discussion from the whole thing okay well um, my apologies for not raising that um, sooner, um, but I, yeah, I didn't realize that it was going to be uh, highlighted separately. Um, so, well, with that, I will recuse myself for the rest of the item, and then um, I will return. Thank you. Do we have any other, everybody got their questions in. Any questions from the public or any on Zoom? I do, I do actually have a hand on oh, Zoom. Wonderful. Let me, uh, Peter Wilk, I'm gonna allow you to speak. Go ahead and unmute yourself and go right ahead. Does that work? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, this is Peter Wilk. I'm on the Planning Commission, and I'm glad you brought up the second story deck issue because that was, in fact, very confusing for us. And uh, I think the facing the issue regarding facing the side of the, the house was, was, in fact, handled by um, there's a figure that Katie has not shown out that shows where decks are allowed, and um, that kind of addresses what the facing issue is. But my issue is um, it, it would be nice to have comments or guidance from our elected officials on this issue in general because there's some members of the commission who just assume ban second story decks altogether uh, for privacy reasons. And then I, on the other hand, say, I've got no problem with second deck, just let them be. And it, it's kind of a privacy versus property rights kind of issue. And so, it, you know, the other, there was obviously people in between, and we struggled with compromise. And, uh, and so we came up with a mismatch, which is probably going to have to struggle with variances on every application. So it would be nice to get something from the council as to just generally which direction we should be leaning. Should we be leaning in terms of, yeah, second story decks are good, let people enjoy the view, enjoy their parties, let's have you know, freedom of property rights, or, you know, hey, we really have to be concerned as the neighbors, the privacy is a major issue, so let's lean in favor of privacy. And, and so it'd be nice to know what you guys think of that, because we are all over the map. Thank you. Great, thank you, Peter. Anybody else on Zoom? No. Okay. 
Jack, did you have a comment? Yeah, I do have a comment. Uh, thank you, Peter, for bringing this up again. So I think, I, I don't know when this issue came before the plan commission, but um, uh, we had a, uh, an application for a house next door to us that wanted a side-facing deck that actually wrapped around. And um, so when our neighbors talked, well, there was some division. But the thing that resolved it was having an opaque piece of glass for the side viewing. Um, so I, I'm sort of in agreement. I don't, I mean, with you, Peter, I, I don't mind decks so much as long as there's some, some way to try to give some sort of privacy. Um, there's visual privacy and there's the fact that people are talking and maybe having parties and stuff like that. Um, I think at least giving something to the issue of privacy helps mitigate uh, people's um, objections. So some way to speak to it, but um, in general, I don't have any problem with that. But you're going to have a new uh, city council, which I will not be on. And um, you may be right, this will come up for <laughs> alterations, so to speak. I, I come from San Francisco, and um, in, in particular parts of the city, there's a lot of upper decks, even ones on the roof, and there's opaque screens that that prevent direct observation of neighbors, and you can still see the sky or something along the distance, a distant view, which is obviously one reason why people like decks. They don't necessarily want to spy on their neighbors. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It just sort of makes that a little bit easier to handle, having a little privacy wall. That's it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Wilk, for your comments. I, um, I agree that this is a, a topic that sometimes needs to be customized based off of the situation and can be a challenge. Um, for, for anyone deciding on the project. And I hope that we don't have to deal with a lot of variances coming, f uh, coming forward to us. Um, but with that, I think we need to start somewhere. And I appreciate the robust conversation that all of you had during planning commission to find a compromise. Um, I, I would like to see some more clarity on the language that um, Mayor Story Katie, I feel like I was looking for you. I see you on the screen. But um, to see some clarity based off of what Mayor Story talked about as well as for the screening and that I think no one wants to amend constantly a zoning code, but we are here today, and I'm sure it's going to come back as things get updated down the road um, and that if we need to readdress these more, these more stringent rules that we're applying for second story decks and balconies, we can do that at that time. Um, in regards to every other item mentioned today, um, I am, I'm in favor of, I know you mentioned Monarch Cove, yeah, all of the other things I am in approval uh, or in agreement of at this time. Thank you. Uh, and, and I just want to note, I am also not in favor of banning second story decks altogether. I feel like privacy, finding privacy measures is a little more realistic than just not having second story decks. Or, you know, in some houses, third story. Uh, well, maybe <laughs> we shouldn't get into that. I don't know how, I don't know where, where, where that rabbit hole leads. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, otherwise, uh, I'm prepared to make a motion if there's no further comments. Uh, I'll just uh, oh. quickly add um, just thank you, Peter, for addressing the council and um, creating a little bit of conversation for us as well. Um, I, I am also in agreement with the rest of council here. I, I do think um, maybe fine tuning the verbiage if we need to. Uh, the, the second story decks, I, we do live in a beautiful town. This is why we're here, right? And uh, everybody has their rights to their beautiful views of this gorgeous town. So um, privacy, um, maybe maybe it just means like 
you got to talk to your neighbor. You got to have a friendly amendment with your neighbor. I, you get the deck <laughs> from six to nine and we'll be out. Well, I don't know. But I think that it can create maybe more of a community thing um, if we're all kind of in agreement there. Um, so thank you, Peter. And um, yeah, if you want to go ahead, Preston, with a motion. Yeah, I uh, will move the recommended action to introduce by first reading, introduce for first reading by title only, waiving further reading of the text and ordinance amending Title 17, zoning of Capitola Municipal Code, amending the Capitola General Plan land use map, and amending the Capitola zoning map, and to adopt the proposed resolution amending the general plan, plan land use map. I'll second that, and I do have a comment or two. Do I need to add something? Yeah, unfortunately, oh, the, the recommended it. the recommended action oh. and Katie, <laughs> Katie's included the changes to the uh, the arbors and Great. pergolas. I was reading it, it off the, the I was reading it off gotcha. the agenda packet. All right, take two. I'd like to motion that we <laughs> introduce for first reading. Do I need to read the whole thing? Mm -hmm. I, no. Oh, okay. Well, I thought <laughs> I had to read the whole thing. <laughs> I wanted you to, though. <laughs> okay, then I, I would uh, like to move recommended action as on the screen. <laughs> I'll second I again. Okay, <laughs> that was a, a double a double movement and a double second. Thank you, Shock. And you do have another comment? I do. Right. You know, um, this reminds me of grammar school when you were brought up to the front of the classroom and you were to read something. And the whole idea was to be able to deliver properly with good pronunciation. I used to be so good at that, I too. Know, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Just reminds me of that. So um, I, I just have two comments. First of all, all the work that Katie and staff has done along with the uh, city planning and it's come to us also. It's really unfortunate, Katie, you can't be here, you know, in a sense of a last hurrah. You, you, everyone has put a lot of work in this, but you know, you as the point person, too bad you're not here. Um, also, I'd like to point out some members of the community that you know, with a long struggle uh, working with their issues, which I think were very legitimate so they can retire, are here. That's the Balaja family. And I'd like to thank you for, you know, working with our staff. And I know personally that you reached out to a lot of neighbors and talked to them and to express your concerns. And uh, to me, that's the way government should work. You, you did everything right. Um, I remember coming to your dining room and uh, talking with you one day and uh, Bob brought me in and I know you reached out to other people. So it's really good to, to see people in Capitola, citizens in Capitola are willing to work with our staff, but it also indicates to me that our staff is also very open and willing to work with neighbors. So I appreciate that on both sides. Those are my comments. All right, I think we can go into roll call. Great. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. And Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. And Mayor Story had to recuse himself, so that is unanimous, and we can bring him back in. Why do we have to read the first one? Why do I have to read the whole first one? <laughs> Catching that up on I, I am. Yeah. <laughs> so Katie, should I try sharing my screen or does it work better if you, you share? It's great when you share. Okay. Give me a second here, I'll have it up in no time. Yeah, so if you can share the PHLA. We move it on to item 80. Yes. We just yeah. want you so, to adjourn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can leave again and come back for adjournment. Um, <laughs> consider a permanent local housing allocation resolution. Uh, the recommended action is adopt proposed resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a permanent local housing allocation program application with a five year plan. The PLHA standard agreement and any subsequent amendments or modifications there too, as well as any other documents which are related to the program on the PLHA grant award. And I believe this is our second view of this item, right? Right. It is. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mayor Story. I, I introduced this a couple weeks back. It's a great new source of funding for our affordable housing program. 
It's tied to Senate Bill 2 and it's a $75 reporting fee on all real estate documents. And so any real estate documents related to properties in Capitola um, are, are put towards this fund. 70% um, of that is, um, goes directly to our city in order to reinvest in affordable housing. So great new uh, revenue stream for us to put towards affordable housing. So next slide, please. Um, the available funding is shown on the slide. It's just over 600000 Next slide, please. Um, the requirements for the application is that we have a five-year plan of how we'll utilize the funds. We have to have a public hearing, which is what we're doing this evening, and then adopting a resolution, and that will be submitted to the state. Next slide, please. These are the 10 um, different qualifying um, projects that you can utilize or activities that you can utilize the funds for. Um, of these, we're choosing to utilize Two of them, the rental housing and uh, for rental housing projects that are fully um, that are affordable for affordable units, and then assisting persons at risk of homelessness. Next slide, please. So for the rental housing projects, this money can go towards pre-development, development, acquisition, rehab, and preservation of multifamily residential live work rental housing that is affordable to extremely low, low, very low or moderate income households, including necessary operating subsidies. We've had um, a couple different nonprofits reach out that are interested in different properties within Capitola, so I think there's a viable option to spend this money in the next few years. Next slide, please. The second item we're proposing is um, to, for assisting persons at risk of homelessness. The, um, the City of Capitola participates in the Housing for Health Partnership program through the county. Currently, we um, contribute 31000 a year. This funding can be utilized to um, contribute towards the H4HP. Um, and we're suggesting 35000 uh, starting to contribute 35000 for the next two years. Um, it's administered by the County of Santa Cruz. It supports year-round emergency shelter operations, uh, two of them, the Salvation Army in Watsonville is as well as Housing Matters in the City of Santa Cruz. Next slide, please. Uh, this breaks down the, how we would utilize the funds by year. So we've already um, contributed towards the homeless shelters for 2020, 2021, and 2022. So for the first three years, we are suggesting just utilizing that towards affordable rental projects. Um, beginning in 2023 and 2024, we're suggesting putting 35000 towards homeless and utilizing the remainder of that towards affordable rental projects. Okay. Next slide, please. So, uh, as stated by the mayor, previously our recommended action tonight is to adopt the proposed resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the permanent local housing allocation PLHA program application with a five-year plan, the PLHA standard agreement, and any subsequent amendments or modifications thereto, as well as any other documents which are related to the program or the PLHA grant award. With that, I'm available for any questions. Looked like there are no questions, Katie. Good job. Oh, well, I spoke too soon. Council Member Bertrand. I have to think a little bit first. So in terms of trying to figure out um, who gets the money for the rental housing, how, how's that done or is it given to the county? I'm just trying to figure that out. Or did you say? So we will, that will be a decision of the city council um, in the next year. We'll be bringing the, um, housing funds forward to the council and possible projects and asking how they'd like to allocate those funds. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to have a conversation with you because I've got a few other questions, but not pertinent right now. Okay. Any other council member questions? Seeing none, are there any members of the public that would like to address the council on this item? Is anyone on Zoom? No. Okay. I'll bring it back to the council for action. I'll move the recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. 
There's a motion by Council Member Tran, seconded by Council Member Brooks to pass the staff recommendation. Do we have a roll call vote? Council Member Brown? Aye. Council Member Brooks? Aye. Council Member Bertrand? I agree. Vice Mayor Kaiser? Aye. And Mayor Story? Aye. The motion passes unanimously, which will bring us to item nine, which is adjournment, and I will adjourn this meeting to the next regularly scheduled, well, it's not regular, it's gonna be on November the 22nd, which is a Tuesday evening um, in honor of Thanksgiving um, that week. Um, on, um, so that'll be November 22nd, um, uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Good night, everyone.